Namaste and a hearty welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Geeta Desai. I'm the producer of the Unveil Trilogy Films and it's a delight to have everybody here on uh, Ayurveda Day and um, a day away from Ayurveda Day, but it's an honor to also welcome the speakers whom I will be very shortly uh, introducing, um, Dr. Martina Ziska and Gayatri Purrani. And uh, before we do that, we're going to just run the, the trailer of my latest uh, documentary, Ayurveda Unveiled. Um, uh, it's just for about five minutes and then we will launch the, the main program. So here we are with, the, I leave you with the trailer. Thank you. At the edge of recorded time, when men and gods merged and walked the lands of ancient India, reveals a remarkably mature civilization. Collectively, they strived to examine and uplift human well-being from every angle. Ayurveda is one of the most ancient and most comprehensive system of healthcare that is known to humanity. We are talking about Ayurveda as a science of enhancing life. This needs a very comprehensive approach. So Ayurveda gives the details of how to do this. Ayurveda takes us from simple things like diet, lifestyle, daily routine, emotional interactions, slowly and very gently to a deeper understanding of the self. The teaching genius of the sages devised daily routines called Dinacharya, one of the single most powerful Ayurvedic tools for maintenance of health and well-being. So what we feel, what we think, what we live, is reflected in our body. It has such detailed explanations of the effects of every single food item imaginable. These are the common spices used in Ayurvedic cooking. These spices alter the quality of the food. The food may not be the problem at all, but how we're consuming the food, how we're living while we're eating this food. Actually, the most important thing is how is your digestive fire working? How strong is your agni? It doesn't just look at the structure or the chemistry of the physical body, but the internal and holistic unitarian life force behind it, which is called prana. It's life force itself as a universal power which sustains the material world. What you exhale, the tree is inhaling. What the tree exhales, you are inhaling. If this alignment happens consciously, this will lead to a phenomenal sense of well-being within you. India's sages derived a bedrock of insights upon which Ayurveda and all Indic knowledge systems were built. Yoga and Ayurveda, they have their origin in the supreme knowledge of the self. Within the human body, the five elements manifest as the three dosha, or the three organizational patterns. The more self-knowledge we have about how we are put together as cells that will benefit us substantially. Health is the dynamic balance between the essence and the waste in the system. You have to strengthen that equilibrium. Your sleep, diet, the bulk of Ayurveda is wellness. Our bodies mirror within all that's in the outer world. Nothing is exempt from this total embrace. In Ayurveda, the focus is on what is at the root of all of this? Why is this happening? Some patients with rheumatoid arthritis might get one verbal preparation and some might get another one. So it could also be a touch, a thought, a sound, and it could also be a light. That's what Vedic medicine is. It's spirit based. <laughs> Ayurveda is trans-scientific.
Ayurveda is trans scientific. Ayurveda is trans scientific. methods of science but also goes beyond it. Having validation through measurement and precision with the modern tools that we have, all this will help in creating a better framework for understanding biological correlates in Ayurveda and Yoga. Every time you see a patient or a client, you educate them about themselves. Empower your patients to be their own doctors. And so you're generating a lot of counter momentum from all these different ways and you're doing it much faster and much 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 safer when they start doing what they always wanted to do the cells began to feel themselves in a place where they were naturally supposed to be so that's healing so it is not about prevention and cure it's about making the body work at its best pure unbounded intelligence provides the blueprint for the proper functioning of the whole physiology. The state of perfect balance, wholeness, harmony. And that is the basis of Ayurveda. You say yes to life, you say yes to things that are supportive of you. And there is inner intelligence within you that is universal that will show you what is right for you. Which is the wisdom which resides within each one of us. This is something that should not be forgotten. And so it is with Ayurveda. Harmony within, and without. That was the trailer and uh, I think I would like to in introduce uh, the speakers before we launch the, uh, a chapter of the film that we're going to share today to uh, kind of uh, formulate the context of the topic that is uh, on, on uh, uh, the plan today. Allopathy, why allopathy, why Ayurveda? So before I do that, let me introduce the celebrated uh, um, wonderful ladies that are going to join us. It seems like it's a woman's day today, but uh, not by plan, but it just so happened that uh, Dr. Ziska was free and Gayatri offered her help. So let me start by welcoming uh, um, Martina, Dr. Martina Ziska. Thank you for your time today. Uh, Martina resides in uh, uh, Prague and um, uh, she has a medical background and uh, specialized in neurology. And uh, this was back in the late 80s that she um, graduated. And then very soon after that, she helped uh, organize a, a Maharishi Ayurveda teaching uh, program for the Czech physicians. And in doing so, she got very drawn into the field of Ayurveda. So very slowly, I'm just uh, fast forwarding her whole life almost up to now, but uh, she uh, got her into very deep study of Ayurveda, eventually moved to USA, practiced Ayurveda, moved back to Prague, and now she has a full-fledged uh, clinical practice. She uh, is very deeply involved in teaching as well, has a Gurukula a master disciple style of uh, an academy where she has very personal contact with the students, um, a very, very rigorous uh, program that she has, uh, has been successful in launching. But most importantly, I would say, having known Martina for so many years, is that her commitment to her self-development is her hallmark. Yoga, meditation, music, chanting, um, mother nature in her life. It's, it's never too far. They're her constant companions. And that translates, I think, 
into her healing powers, which are quite unmatched, I would say. Clarity, her knowledge, her love for healing. Um, uh, when she was a child, I, I'll conclude now, Martina. When she was a child, she declared to her father, I want to open a clinic of health, not illness. And she has lived up to that. I, I would say she has completely lived up to that. So thank you for being with us and welcome Martina. And now to Gayatri. So Gayatri Puranik is a resident of Heidelberg. Thank you for joining us Gayatri. Um, and she comes from a traditional family, uh, a lineage that had um, a very, very strong keepers of Ayurveda in the form of Vaidyas, uh, grandfathers, great grandfathers, Vaidyas, uh, which are, who are physicians of Ayurveda, um, and which then led into, I think, businesses that produced uh, very, very authentic Ayurvedic products, scholars, etc. And uh, for the last, I believe, 30, 40 years, uh, Gayatri has been living in Germany. Germany, and she has, in her own way, contributed to the to the tradition by launching her own brand of products called Ashwamedh. You can look up the website, but the hallmark here is authenticity, purity, um, really very, very good products uh, in terms of herbs, medicines, oils, etc. So her contribution, I would say, is bridging the gap between the East and the West for the European market. Well, she, she does webinars, uh, talks, blogs, uh, writes for magazines, I believe, Ayurvedic magazines. And this way she bridges the understanding, which is so important for a Western mind, for such an ocean of uh, information. So it's a delight to have you, Gayatri, with us. And with that, I leave everybody to watch a 20-minute chapter in my film, Ayurveda Unveiled. Um, that chapter is titled as Allopathy and Ayurveda. It's not Allopathy versus Ayurveda, but Allopathy and Ayurveda, the understanding of the differences, the meeting points, and how do we integrate uh, or not, in, not integrate the two is what we will find later after the viewing. So I leave you with that for now, and then we will continue with the talks. Thank you. In order to understand Ayurveda, you have to understand the worldview from which it comes. And this worldview is very different from the modern scientific, you know, technological industrial worldview. Genesis, God tells the first humans that I give you this planet and all the creatures that crawl on it and all the fish that swim in the oceans and the rivers and all the fowl that fly in the air, every herb and seed and grain, I give you dominion over it. Nature is not a factory. We know this. You know, you can eat oranges from one tree and they could be very different from an orange from another tree, depending on so many things, on the climate, on the properties of the soil. Even the idea of this Western medicinal idea of standardization, of expiry dates, of packaging, of putting them all you know, in these little gelatin capsules and fixed amounts and trying to look at how it is absorbed in the blood, it doesn't work that way. How are you going to prove how the personality of the plant got absorbed in your personality? Allopathy presumes that Everything is a material cause. 
it assumes that by fixing the material cause there will be a chain reaction all the way to the psychological results which are according to it phenomena of matter of material processes and it assumes that every imbalance can be fixed by material triggers ayurveda starts from the other side it starts with the assumption or the recognition that there is an imbalance already present at a psycho spiritual level which leads to a material imbalance which is a symptom the whole direction and understanding is reversed and one has to treat not symptoms but the root causes and therefore the medicine itself should operate at that level and the medicine may not always be material it may also have a psychological component the pharmaceutical approach that is used in what we call standard western medicine is based on the idea that uh, if you can interfere with the mechanism of illness through a molecule you should be able to get rid of the illness and in fact it works in acute illnesses but when you look at chronic illnesses um, then um, unless we address the fundamental causes of illness then the disease recurs not only does it recur but because the biological model is based on a biomolecule that interferes with a specific mechanism and the body is one whole system you end up with uh, side effects and you end up with pretty standard side effects almost to everything from starting with nausea vomiting you know fatigue lack of uh, concentration uh, sleep disturbances this approach is very invasive and works phenomenally well when there's an emergency but it is not a way of creating health as you say modern medicine it's about medicine it's not about health there is no modern health health has always been there if this body feels whole it is health modern medicine has become a huge industry so once something becomes a, a a huge commercial operation there are certain compulsions there are investments and there are returns and there are investors and there are returns for them stakeholders once you get into this mode then slowly i'm not saying it has but slowly health may take a back seat because these are big companies making this drug development instrument develop devices develop these are all done by companies investing huge sums of money so there is a tremendous pressure to market so what happens is in the us unlike in britain or canada they have a system called nice national institute of clinical excellence these are bodies uh, professional people statisticians physicians and so on highly respected they look at uh, all the clinical trials done in cardiology of disease let us say they will say this stress test is to be done under these conditions angiogram should be done this is there are guidelines for all this these guidelines this not a law enforced on people but what happens virtually is like this these guidelines are issued by nice it is an independent body supported by the government by professionals but once these come out insurance companies the british national health service they will reimburse only if this is done as per these guidelines if a patient and a physician they want to spend their own money and do all this they are welcome so virtually becomes compulsory we have to understand that allopathy is not a, everything is bad in everything but it's a body centric approach it focuses on the material aspects the cells and the metabolism and the physiological processes it works wonderfully there but man is not just matter it is good at looking at a disease but what it is really not doing at all is looking at health and it's also not looking at a person the person is not a diagnosis is not a disease it's not a problem the person is much more than that and there is within the current system no technology for that 
So even in psychiatry, we are not touching on things such as um, soul, for example. We are not touching at things as collective experience, as memories of generations. We don't have that understanding. We have a big elephant in the room which nobody wants to talk about. And we are trying to look at research, whether it's about cholesterol, whether it's about pain or inflammation, and we still miss the whole boat from where everything else is happening. Although we understand that there is a psychosomatism, we understand or think we know. Uh, the question is, how does it translate into practical way of dealing with things? All driven by the pharmaceutical company. They put the Looking, looks into ethnopharmacology, sees like some effect on some plant, and then they take that plant and they divide it into fractions, alcohol fraction, water fraction, oil fraction sometimes, and then they find out what, where the, the effect that they want is, they keep isolating it, they find a single molecule, they patent it, and they get rich. That is, the, that is what's driving this single molecule medicine like profits, not wellness. We have separated those herbs into these super fine extracts and alkaloids, and now they have become refined molecules and medicines in which they have forgotten their holistic feeling about how the herb used to be. So within the herb, there is an ecological state where everything is balanced with space, air, fire, water, and earth. And you take one extract and then it becomes a misguided molecule. So it creates multiple side effects because of that. There's no pharmaceutical that's free of that. Moreover, um, as time goes by, the pharmaceuticals become ineffective because the body uh, adjusts to them. It's a phenomenon called tachyphylaxis. So in Ayurveda, we have a belief that you use the herb as a whole and treat the patient as a whole. You get turmeric, this epic herb with 500 fantastic molecules. But then people focus on just three of these molecules, the curcuminoids, which amounts to about three or four percent of turmeric. And they're looking at the mass, they're infatuated with the mass. It's and they're missing all, all the, the fullness of turmeric and and the energetics of it, much less the spirit is totally out the window. One of the biggest side effects of modern medications from an Ayurvedic perspective is the long-term negative effect on the mind. If you see the literature of most of the modern medications, many of them have as a side effect tendency for depression or suicide, which is an impact of a visha. Whereas in Ayurveda, the medicine has to be an amrita because you come out of the disease rejuvenated, feeling full of life and wanting to live and be happy and make others happy. Let me give you an example of the difference between whole herb and single molecule medicine. You're hiking through the Andes and you have another 20 kilometers to go. You take the some cocoa leaves, have a little bit of lime, put it in the corner, up to your palm. In, in your mouth there, and you hike another 10 or 20 pounds. No problem. So that's the whole herb. But you take one molecule out of there, cocaine, wow, this beautiful Andean experience of just hiking and, and, and being in this full and being sattvic and cocaine, this one molecule, that is a great example of the difference between single molecule medicine and a whole. There are two ways to deal with a problem. One way is to reduce uh, the negative, the non-wanted, which a modern medicine tries to do. And then the second way is to support the desirable, the, the health, the, the equalizing things, the harmonizing things, which Ayurveda works with. It actually works with both. You have to create better energy, better habits, better thinking. You have to replace the bad things with good things. We are talking about Ayurveda as a science of enhancing life, not just as a curative process. So this needs to be approached as such. To work in a sustainable way, you have to have a long-term vision with your patients and what you want to do with them. And the best thing is to educate patients. Partake in a process where you 
empower your patients to be their own doctors. This is what I really like about Ayurveda, that it offers so much educational aspects to health that are so easy to follow. They learn that they directly themselves can influence and change their state of being and their health. And that's extremely empowering. Within the Vedas lies the field of study on warfare called Dhanurveda. It includes the oldest mention of the word marma and their power to heal and inflict in equal measure. Simply put, marma is a vital point in the human body under which lies a confluence of Okay, so we can now um, hand over the program to Dr. Martina Ziska. The film, uh, the chapter, by the way, that you just watched is part of a five hour documentary that I produced. It was released last year. It's part uh, of that film called Ayurveda Unveiled The Art and Science of a Life Well Lived. And I highly recommend um, you buy it and watch it because it's a perfect introduction to the story of Ayurveda. As much as man knows its beginnings, its philosophy, its grammar, its uh, uh, you know, uh, in-depth uh, treatments and how allopathy, Ayurveda compare, etc., etc. So um, that can be, uh, we will be showing you the link to the, to the film very soon when, before we leave, but uh, please do look into Purchasing it, it's very archival, it's a classic, so it will have to be viewed many, many, many times. So it's important that uh, you own it and uh, use it if uh, you really want to have a wonderful view of uh, the story of Ayurveda. Thank you. So now uh, Dr. Ziska takes over and uh, I can enjoy the, the knowledge and all of you as well. Go ahead, Martina. What would you like to say? Namaskar. Um, it's like a big family. We are here and uh, I greet everyone. Um, and I hope today is uh, Diwali so that the light of knowledge um, is with us. And that's the whole purpose. Uh, Gita did uh, the documentary. Um, I would uh, beg to differ. You said it's an introductory level. It's an introductory and advanced and deep advanced and professional and forever. Um, I have watched it several times and every time I watch it, I learn something new. It's endless uh, source of knowledge, just like Ayurveda is. So our topic is allopathy and Ayurveda and being on both sides myself, I thought what I would do put them briefly side to side so we can glance um, some understanding. Um, what is their focus and therefore what can we draw from them and how can we uh, work with both? So you have heard uh, beautifully uh, addressed in uh, the chapter that we just watched that in allopathy, uh, the focus is on material and everything is material. And Ayurveda is a psycho-spiritual level or comes from uh, spirit. We can also say, and I like to look at the, it this way, it helps me um, in my framework of working and thinking and working, therefore, that the body is crystallized co consciousness. Uh, what it means, uh, it's very profound. And we come um, back to that uh, because it has uh, the deepest and largest implications. From the name itself, you hear that allopathy pati is focused on a problem, on a disease. And Ayurveda in translation, uh, science of life is actually not focused only on health, but more widely on life itself. There's always a question about the science, uh, how scientific uh, Ayurveda is. 
And um, to settle that, there's only one science. Um, to me, uh, allopathic medicine is more a science of a test tube and Ayurveda is a science of life. And what is remarkable is that Ayurveda in its scientific approach has not changed or revised anything along the thousands of years. So the knowledge stays same, um, which means it has been perfect and complete from the very beginning. And we know that in uh, modern science, we have a very different strategy that we are discovering piece by piece, uh, and the next discovery uh, means the revision to the previous view. Um, in the allopathy, of course, because we come from everything is material, the body is a chemical factory, um, there is one strategy that fits all. There's one approach that fits all and one strategy that fits all. Unlike in Ayurveda, uh, where we look at each person as a unique individual. Um, in the modern medicine, we're looking at uh, the specialized separate, uh, we can say fragment approach, while in Ayurveda, uh, everything is connected in the body, in the life. And the, the main factors are really uh, Kala, which is the time, and it's used um, in uh, continuum very interestingly. So we're looking at uh, continuum of generations, for example. We look at continuum of time in one's person life that, that they have uh, uh, certain um, periods that are uh, specific uh, and therefore mean certain tendencies and predilections. There is also continuum within uh, the seasons and the day, uh, which determines uh, what uh, we all, that we all are subject of certain uh, rules and therefore uh, choices and behaviors. And um, to the approach, I would point out the unique role of mind or consciousness, which is really uh, very unique, very specific in Ayurveda and does not exist in the allopathy at all. And um, just to move um, to the end, um, to us as users of both systems, um, the modern medicine really approaches its place as the doctor or the system, the medical system holds the responsibility. And the patient is the passive receiver. It just follows the recommendations uh, or the guidelines the doctor uh, uh, gives, uh, which is very unlike in Ayurveda, where I would say that the patient as, is the co-creator, is a, is a true partner in the process. And ultimately, it is the patient that makes the choices uh, that uh, bring the health balance or the opposite. So what it needs is that um, the patient is educated and this is the role of the doctor and it takes the responsibility for the situation um, but also sees it as an opportunity. So um, this different approaches I think can be nicely uh, illustrated on the current approach to the uh, pandemic situation. If you look at how modern uh, medicine and science is approaching it, it's saying uh, let's do uh, very known uh, approaches as isolation, uh, protect yourself from the exposure, which is the prevention, which to us would be um, uh, dealing with a gun to the external causes, then there are no recommendations what to do when you get sick. And if you get very severely sick, then you go to the hospital and again, then you are um, dealt with uh, highly skilled professionals, but you have no role in the whole process. Now, on the other hand, um, Ayurveda is saying the best way to fix um, external danger is to be strong. In other words, not to become a good host. Um, and that is a qu question of immunity. 
Um, now, immunity in Ayurveda, it's a, it's a, a huge uh, concept, but we can say very simply that our immunity that we have is a result of um, ahara, which is proper nutrition, vihara, which is proper uh, behavior in terms of uh, daily routine, seasonal routine, uh, uh, exercise, rest, and manasika, which is the mental approach. So there is a lots of uh, preventative measures one can do. There is a lots of self-help care one can do to support. There's a lot one can do in the early stages of the disease um, to boost uh, through the natural approaches and medicines. And uh, even later, one can work with uh, skilled professional um, on um, helping uh, not to get to the bad situation. So um, to put all of this together, I ask myself a question. If we would say, uh, what is the best way to benefit from both systems? And I came up with a very simple uh, algorithm, which I think we all can agree with. And that is, uh, if you already are healthy and you want to stay healthy, maintain or improve your health, Ayurveda is the system. If you want to become healthy, Ayurveda is the system. If you are sick, uh, depends on how much you are sick and what is your inclination, whether you go for uh, working naturally or uh, working um, uh, with the allopathic medicine. Sometimes it's necessary to combine both. Um, but really, uh, what you use, it depends on your inclination on, on the uh, specific problem that you have, and also on the openness and willingness and skill of the doctors working uh, with both systems. So there is always a question in uh, Ayurveda, how come the simple uh, measures are so effective? How is that possible? Or um, I can say it also in a different way. Why uh, do we put such an emphasis on uh, the simple measures of self-care, self daily routine and such? And um, for that, I would come back to uh, what I said initially, and that is that the body is the crystallized consciousness. What it actually means that every cell knows what is natural and what is not. It's, it's its own intelligence and it uses it for that. So there are cells in our body that know um, to grab the COVID uh, virus and there are cells in the body that know that uh, they will not be grabbing it. They, they have nothing to do with it and, and uh, they stay unattached uh, by it uh, completely. Um, the... The intelligence works, of course, uh, with what's going on around with our en environment. So uh, when the environment and the cell, therefore, are in a natural mode, what they do, they produce uh, balance, therefore health. And then when they are in unnatural mode, they are, we can say, unwell. They, they produce dis-ease, which means you can imagine that um, going on a boat along the stream, which is the balance, um, you, you're going with what is natural, where the river is flowing, and um, the unnatural state is uh, you are paddling in your boat against the stream, and you know that the stronger the stream is, the more difficult and exhausting uh, it is. So it's really important, I think, to ask ourselves a question, how do we create the natural? Um, well, uh, there is a word, um, I think it's in um, Rigved, actually, um, one of the uh, first words there that is Nritta. And Nritta, out of it came Ritta, which is uh, the seasons and uh, the Dinacharyas, all the, all the routines. And Nritta means natural law means this is how things work and what is normal and natural for them. So for rhythm, it means to uh, follow the rhythm that is given by nature in the day, in the seasons, in the life seasons, uh, 
in the periods of life through which we are going. Um, in the ahar, it means um, eating what is natural, having a natural nutrition, the wholesome, um, uh, in as much natural state as possible. And it's also uh, what is natural for our thoughts, um, manasika. Um, so these three approaches in combination, we always use for uh, therapy. And uh, therefore, I think it's fair to say um, that there's only one way, and that is natural way. And, and that is Ayurveda. So there is not Ayurvedic or non-Ayurvedic way. There is only one way, and that's natural way. And that happens to be a subject of Ayurveda. So if you happen to suffer from a problem, or if you um, just don't feel optimal, um, and, and want to see how robust health and life, uh, good life, balanced life you can have. Look at these three, review these three, review your vihar, review your ahar, and if you review your manas, manasika approach. And um, in the documentary, they are dealt with very beautifully in a very detailed, so you can use that as uh, your guide. It's actually, the documentary is actually a visual textbook. So you learn there uh, a lot and you will be learning uh, over and over. So uh, what I would like in conclusion to be my uh, takeaway points perhaps would be um, number one, um, if you want to change, you have to make a decision. It's on a level of your personal deep decision. It's called Sankalpa. And you have to have a belief that the decision is possible that you can change your situation. That would be, I guess, the Manasika approach, uh, even deeper. But without that, without a conviction that uh, you want to make a change and that change is possible, no change can happen. Uh, second, review these three, uh, your habits, your routines, your approaches, uh, your thoughts, your nutrition, and ask yourself a question, where do I see a need to change? And I'm sure something very simply will jump at you immediately. Um, that's a common sense. And the next question is, um, how do I change these? And you can either use the knowledge that you have or the knowledge that you get from the tools uh, such as the documentary, or you can always work with um, a Ayurvedic professional that has more knowledge uh, to guide you. Uh, but in the end, no matter uh, who is giving you advice to uh, treat you, to help you, you always will fall back into uh, these basic things because they create the maximum of your daily, uh, daily energy. And that's the energy that determines overall how you can live. So uh, always something to improve. And um, there is no end to how wonderful life we can have. So to that, I wish we all make our choices as best as we can. Namaskar. Thank you, Martina. Beautiful, lots to digest. But again, as Martina and I said, if all this is very elaborately covered in the film. Um, so we hand over the mic, so to say, to Gayatri and uh, please take over. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar to everybody. As uh, Gita introduced me, I have been living in Germany for the last uh, 30 years, but I come from India, from uh, Mumbai, and uh, the um, nature you see behind me is uh, outside of Mumbai. So uh, that's where I come from <laughs> originally. And uh, in India, whilst we were growing up, um, Perhaps just a small supplement to what uh, Gita said about my background. Uh, my family has been in um, manufacturing of Ayurvedic medicines, uh, the pasmas and uh, the rasa preparations in India since a couple of generations. 
So I am very much at home in um, the industrial commercial side of uh, Ayurveda and have had um, an enlightening 30 years in Europe comparing what is it that we do in India, what is different in Europe um, as a lay person, as a person, a non-doctor, so a user, a consumer of Ayurveda as well as um, somebody who has had to kind of help bridge across these cultural understandings or the concepts of um, European thinking and uh, Indian Ayurvedic yogic uh, or Vedic thinking. Um, so it has been very interesting and very challenging. We were talking about science. Um, Dr. Tsiska mentioned, uh, and even in the chapter on Ayurveda and allopathy, uh, there was the mention of science uh, several times. And unfortunately, Ayurveda always gets, um, um, you know, uh, there is always this question about, is it a science or is it, you know, do you have to believe in it? And I do get a little upset about that, I have to admit. Um, as I have discovered in Germany, the definition of a science, as per the German definition or understanding of what a science is, a science is when you have an hypothesis and then you develop a method to try and prove your hypothesis and then you observe. Can you prove your hypothesis by using this method or can you not? And if you cannot, how do you need to change your method or how do you change your hypothesis? And if you take this very neutral definition of science, or you take that as a basis for understanding what is a science, then I'm sure everybody who's listening here will understand that with Ayurveda, if you needed to prove that oil, oiling the body, will reduce vata in the body, then you have to define what is vata, you have to define what you mean by oil, and then you have to have your parameters to which will help you judge, are you changing the situation of vata in your body by using oil? And this using oil is the method. And so if you do that, and if you can repeat this exercise many times, and you will always get the same result, then obviously you have proved your hypothesis on the basis of your observations, which do not need to be with uh, uh, expensive equipment, but you have set a hypothesis, a method, your observations, and you have proved it time and time again. And that is the definition of science, even by European German thinking. And if you can do that in Ayurveda, then why isn't Ayurveda also a science as per general understanding? I mean, all of us who are acquainted with Ayurveda know that it is a science. And we're always endeavoring to kind of, you know, uh, make sure that people understand that it's not just a matter of belief. I mean, it works. And uh, when I came from India to Germany, um, I hadn't really thought too much about it. And, um, and at some point of time, right, during my first pregnancy, I mean, I grew up with Chavan Prash and I grew up with uh, all the things that we take in India uh, to or the home remedies, so to speak. And it wasn't, it was neither a question of belief, nor was it a question of science. So, um, yeah, when I did come here, um, as a child, you know, you generally, your mother says, take this, and you go like, mm, I don't want to. So I had never really taken Chavan Prash. And in Germany, during my first pregnancy, I, um, I was getting very tired in the evening. And, you know, at that point of time, I remembered, mm, yeah, uh, Chavan Prash is supposed to help you. So I just started taking it. And I just took it because, well, you know, there's something that you can use to help yourself, so you do it. So it, isn't, I, it wasn't as if I believed that Chavan Prach would help me. And I was amazed at what a difference it did make. So if you can understand what I'm trying to say, 
it isn't a matter of belief and it isn't a matter of um, proving something in a laboratory. And that is the wonder of Ayurveda, that you have all these very simple possibilities of using the science on your own. And, um, and, it, and that is the meaning of empowerment. You can use the information, you can use the knowledge that you get in your daily life, and you can make your own experiments. You know, so as a generally healthy person, I'm not talking about um, ill persons, but as a generally healthy person, you can conduct your own experiments to find out what is good for you. And you learn with that. And with that, there's another point that you know, has um, struck me over the many years that I've been in Europe, is that with these sciences of yoga and Ayurveda and meditation, you are always going within. You are looking at yourself. Um, you are reflecting on um, how you react to your environment and how can you improve that. And the awareness that you get by observing yourself is what is going to help you. So you are your own instrument. You are your own uh, thermometer. You are your own laboratory in that sense. So you're not um, depending on an external source, an app or another instrument to tell you what is good for you and what is not good for you. This morning in the radio, uh, there was a discussion on um, uh, the labeling of uh, products in Europe. And uh, there has been a debate on the so-called Nutri-Score, so that uh, you know, if people can figure out what is healthy for them and what is not healthy for them, you will have these um, red, green, and yellow symbols on a product label which is supposed to tell you, is this going to be healthy for you or not? And if you kind of you know, think about it a little bit, um, it is again taking away from you your power to think and judge for yourself. This is again an external instance telling you what is good for you and what is bad for you. And the reason why they, have, they are trying to come up with this Nutri-Score in Europe is because um, apparently more than 50% of the food consumed by uh, the population is uh, finished ready-made food. And we all know what the results of um, this kind of nutrition are likely to be. And to save the consumer the trouble of reading a long list of ingredients and knowing the list of ingredients, they are simplifying this by coming up with uh, the red, yellow, and green uh, markings on the label of a finished product. But again, I know as somebody coming from an industry and you know, getting all the newsletters from um, <clears throat> the, the, the nutraceutical industry, nutritional um, in, um, yeah, the, the commercial setup that if you find something which will substitute sugar but still give some sweetness to your product, then the industry jumps on that. And if you're trying to judge something by numbers on the basis of numbers, does it have so many calories? Does it have so much sugar? Does it have so much whatever? These are numbers. And if you're trying to base your judgment on what is good for you or bad for you only on these numbers, then you are not really going the whole way in understanding what is good for you. And we as consumers, we as people are actually giving up our freedom to these um, external instances who will tell you what is good for you and what is bad for you. And you, know, you will go a certain way to um, follow this red, green, and yellow symbol. But at some point of time, you're going to realize that um, that's, not the whole, that's not the whole truth. And it's, all, it's again a little shortcut, 
which is not going to give you the final result of good health. So, um, yeah, there are many such examples that I have kind of, you know, uh, sensed in the, or, or observed in the last uh, 30 years in Europe. And I'm very grateful for having had this opportunity to, um, you know, compare Ayurveda to understand Ayurveda from a very different perspective. Had I stayed on in India, I would probably not have been confronted with all these differences. And uh, so I'm really grateful for being here and being able to uh, constantly compare, see, okay, how is this different? How is this different? If I may just give a very sweet anecdote that my daughter told me the other day. Um, she, uh, uh, my daughter is now studying in another city. So she came back uh, on, on the holidays and, um, um, I mean, we have, we have in our kitchen, we have a cupboard full of spices. And um, uh, initially I used to write the names in, in my mother tongue so that my daughters will, you know, be acquainted with the name of the spice in, in my mother tongue. And at some point of time, I must have forgotten, filled something, whatever. And my daughter said, you know, she knows how her, um, um, the people she stays with, how they cook and they don't know how to use spices. And she says, you know, sometimes she just opens the cupboard, opens the bottle, smells it and tells them, this is okay. And they ask her, so how do you know? She says, yeah, well, you just smell it and you then you understand, is it good or is it not good? Will it, will it suit this particular vegetable or dish or whatever? And what I'm trying to say with this is, that, um, and she came back and she said, you know, since sometimes we looked at this label, sometimes we didn't, but just learning from the sense of smell and trying to figure out, is this going to suit this particular vegetable? Or is this, how is this going to taste? Uh, putting this two and two together, learning through your senses and learning to think and judge for yourself is something that, should actually come automatically to everybody. And you should not really need a new tree score to tell you this is good for you or this is bad for you. So, you know, talking about Ayurveda and allopathy, I think I've kept it on a very broad level as, as a consumer. And um, um, I hope uh, you will take a bit of this, uh, this knowledge and my observations and be able to uh, use that as well in, uh, your daily life. Um, with uh, um, just a few words on Gita's film, the wonderful part about Gita's film is that, you know, you have all these several books on Ayurveda and you have all these people saying marvelous things. And in Gita's film, it has been said in, in, a, in a very personal kind of way. You have seen in the trailer as well as um, a, the, this chapter on Ayurveda and allopathy. It has been said in a, in a manner, you get these little nuggets of wisdom um, set in a background, which makes it easier for you to digest. And the setting is European and Western. So it doesn't, it is not something that's coming from far away, but it is something that's there all over in Europe, in America, and everywhere outside of India. And you have parts of India which are also being shown. So that's really something that I appreciated in Gita's film and uh, you know, it brought so many things together and made it easier to understand again. Thank you, Gita. Thank and you. with that, I hope I haven't taken too long uh, oh, talking I, I about it. <laughs> I want to support something beautiful that you said, and I just by backtracking on research and numbers and is Ayurveda scientific, which is covered in the film, but I say this everywhere because it's missed. The creators of Ayurveda, the Rishi Munis, the sages, the, there's a whole chapter on what kind of people they were. So their meditative practices allowed them to look at the research within them. They were the laboratories. They devoted centuries of work. It was refined. They got damaged probably themselves by experimenting things on themselves. So it wasn't like just in like allopathy is two, 300, 400 years old. I'm talking about centuries of work. So research has already been done in Ayurveda. 
It was a different laboratory, which today the Western world can't even attempt to do it because these human beings were researchers of the highest order, intuition and meditation. Every cell in their body was bursting with meditation. Can you imagine what kind of knowledge they were uh, in, you know, visualizing? And so research has already been done they just didn't need number, as, as uh, Gayatri beautifully put, but I'm just backtracking and just underlining that research was done in the mountains, in the forests, within nature, in the caves, in their bodies. So let us embrace that and understand it very deeply. And now they have asked us to become our own lab laboratories, like Gayatri mentioned. And that's the best way, empower yourselves unhook from this commercial nonsense where they want you to buy, be on a treadmill, well, buy, 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 and not know anything about yourself. No, we have to, otherwise the world is never going to be healthy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So we leave you all to questions uh, for Martina or Gayatri or you know whichever way we want to conduct. Uh, Ilinka can um, uh, help with the uh, reading out of the questions, please, Ilinka, if there are any. Or maybe Martina can comment or Gayatri if you want to add more while we wait so that we don't lose time. We have a young doctor with us, uh, Anusha Shastri. Perhaps okay. Uh, Anusha, would you like to share your views on the chapter on Ayurveda and allopathy? I think she's muted. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Hello, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Oh, yeah, my uh, regards to everyone. Very glad to be here and uh, this surely was a very uh, informative session for me and uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. Thanks to you, ma'am. Uh, and uh, yes, as uh, uh, Dr. Martina stated and as uh, uh, Gayatri ma'am said, Ayurveda, it, the logic is there and it is not instead of questioning what it's there, the moment we start believing in that, so probably that is when we start realizing uh, all the law, I mean, we start realizing that it has all the logic already present in it. So uh, it's, it's very important and uh, I feel uh, it's the right way that we are going now. And uh, yeah, I look forward to many more uh, sessions of Ayurveda and to spread the knowledge of Ayurveda and to learn more about Ayurveda, in fact. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's wonderful. So uh, the the film covers a whole chapter on folk Ayurveda, which uh, Gayatri is continuing in <laughs> in Germany. Her daughters have proof that she has imbibed that. You know, I learned a lot from my grandmother, my mother, not as a learning, but as just an observation. They never tasted their food. They never measured. There were no recipes you know, into the food. It was, you know, just intuitive estimation of what works. And there were some principles that were passed down. This food goes with this spice. Everybody knew it, unwritten rule. And so this was the genius, I think, of the sages, that how do we make this so, um, what shall I say, widespread, is also <clears throat> teach the common man, the common woman, the basic principles of Ayurveda. They should not be in the, in the Vaidya's room or they should not be in the hands of books, uh, you know, scholars or writers. It should go into the mainstream. And I think that was the genius of the sages, the folk Ayurveda that every grandmother knew if there's a pain in the muscle, what to, which oil to apply or what spice to, it's just unbelievable to me that that mastermind, that folk Ayurveda, even the British rule could not wipe it out. And today we still see the remnants in Germany, in Gayatri's home, with modern daughters who are going to college. 
how better can it be? And today we have none of that with children. They're eating fast food. I mean, in America, there's no connection. So thank you. And we have a question, I think, uh, from somebody who raised their hand. Yes. Hi, Iris, yes. <laughs> And uh, I, I just would like to, to give a little comment to what you were telling now. I, I'm German and I grew up in the south of Germany. And my mother did as you told exactly. When I was uh, sick as a child, she never call, uh, called the doctor. She was using natural um, um, uh, remedies to uh, bring down the fever or to heal the, the cough and so on. And only when the fever didn't uh, went away after some days, she was calling a doctor. So it's exactly the way I would always recommend to the people, please start with natural remedies and if they don't help, when you can consult the doctor. Absolutely. So I think it's, um, it's very good that we have the allopathy because there are very um, uh, uh, tough diseases and Ayurveda cannot heal them. But I think for keeping your health and for, um, for, for um, uh, developing a self um, um, a confidence and also an um, um, responsibility towards yourself, it's very important uh, to know the, the principles of Ayurveda, to follow the principles of Ayurveda. So it's an, a real appeal to, uh, to, to develop your own responsibility. And what is going on in the Western countries, and I'm following this for, for a lot of years already, is that there's a really shift from the own responsibility to the responsibility of some uh, um, um, people outside, and they always take away a part of your own responsibility. But in the end, the bill are paying yourself. And that's the, yeah. that's the big problem what is happening. And I was, um, I was observing this for really for a long, long time, when I saw how the, our social system was uh, changing, how our um, economic system was changing. There was always the influence from the West. Also in Germany was the influence from the West and the German system itself changed a lot. So I think there's a, a big shift in the whole world and also India should pay attention that the, the West is not going too deep into the system there because it's happening already. If I see what the governments are doing in India, there is not a difference so much. They are always looking to the West. They are, yeah. it's, it's, uh, the problem is, is universal now. And I think- I agree. I agree because India is also going the allopathic way, even Ayurveda, yeah. how to treat, how to treat. Ayurveda teaches you not to get sick in the first place and nobody's talking about it. People don't have money. They should have more health clinics like Martina said. Clinics of health are what India requires because people are poorer over there. Yeah. Just basic health uh, tips. So you're right, they're going the West way, still going that way. That's also what uh, uh, Mr. Kotecha is telling. Um, Gayatri and me, we, we had an interview with him and um, I was asking him um, uh, if they are doing it because they can't afford the health system like in the Western countries for, for one billion of people. And he told exactly. So, but what they are doing is very interesting and it's also very clever because they are giving, they are now training people in the countryside to give the basic wisdom, the basic knowledge to the people in, uh, to rural people so that they can first heal themselves. And if this does not help, there are uh, service centers they can go to. They are training the people there in the service centers. And they are setting up 50,000, it was, uh, Gaia yes, 50,000. 50,000 mm. training centers all over India to, uh, to spread this um, uh, knowledge about Ayurveda. This is very interesting and also very clever. But mm. in one day, and he also told this, they will ask some money for it, little money. 
but we know what is what is meaning it. It will go. <laughs> the little bit of money will become always a little bit higher, and so it's a it's a strategy also. I think. Yeah. Well, I, I would just like to add to that that. Uh, little bit defend the um, Indian Ayurvedic uh, system and approach. I have been uh, due to uh, pandemic uh, part of uh, lots of discussions uh, with Indian um, Ayush and um, there is a true recognition that the education of Ayurveda is um, has been uh, under strong and undue influence of uh, allopathic medicine. Yeah. And there is uh, lots of true genuine effort um, mm -hmm. to change that, to correct that, and to move towards the best system of education we know. And that's a Gurukula system. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that uh, this requires qualified teachers Right. Um, we don't have that. And also very dedicated students, which we usually don't have such a dedication either. So um, it's a process there is going to take time. But uh, as every problem, first, you have to accept that there is a problem, recognize, and then you look for ways to, to improve it. But this is something for the future generations uh, to do. But I think we all can contribute to that by um, pravachana, teaching, sharing by example or anywhere we have an opportunity, like Gayatri's daughter is doing, um, uh, telling uh, you know strangers uh, this spice is okay, and if it tastes good, then they are interested and they learn something. And uh, this is the way it goes. I mean, this is science of life. Uh, just as you were saying, um, I grew up with my grandmother's remedies, and I have not heard word Ayurveda until I was uh, 24 years old, and and I finished medical school. I have not I have not even knew under communistic regime that anything like that existed thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. The most interesting part was then when I was learning Ayurveda and was looking at what my mother and grandmother and all the people in the country were using without this knowledge was perfectly Ayurvedic. Exactly. So uh, this is not prerogatory of Ayurveda. This is a nature science. That's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And it's available for everyone. Yeah. Everywhere That's... with knowledge. Yeah, but... Martina, if I may add to what you just said, your, your defense for the India uh, teams, et cetera, how they're looking at the problem. In the film, I have covered Maharishiji's biography and what he did in the shortest period of time for Ayurveda. There is another biography of P.S. Varir, the giant Vaidya from Kerala, who, re who salvaged Ayurveda from the British clause. And we have Ayurveda mostly because of him today. The, the, the survival. So what I learned from those two are that there was a huge uh, problem, like we are facing the education problem that you just mentioned, but they grabbed it by the neck and they did, they put every ounce of them and very quickly they found a solution. It's the time. Now you can, these days there are conferences and talks and this is wrong and that is wrong. I feel like whatever they can do, Ayush or the government, it has to be at God's speed and, and in a very forcible way, like Maharishi and um, Varyarji are examples to me, that they did realize if we don't do it soon, it's going to lose, we are going to lose out. So I don't know what the solution is, but they have to find uh, some way and put resources and minds and bring the key people together and say, look, you know, we need your help. There are enough ideas who are now going the allopathic way, you know, there are conferences and talks and books and, you know, promoting themselves. No, it's time to teach now to, re to retain this knowledge. It's time. Yeah. So yeah. I think something faster has to happen or we lose it. They have to, the people who have power, the ministries, the governments, they have money. That's the whole thing. I, I think this might, uh, it actually might be the urgency is brought by the pandemic 
as well because yeah. we are recognizing yeah. that um you know when one small microorganism decides to flourish um the whole humanity is powerless yeah and despite um putting so much resources into uh, science and medicine, we are not getting any healthier. We are actually getting sicker. So yeah. there is a problem fundamentally. And um, we all have to look at it from all standpoints. There's a lot of talk about uh, bringing the education already early on to the children, um, to, the, to the generations where it's set up the habits. Um, uh, that's right, but I would say any any place is a good place. Any Definitely. time, anywhere, we can do something to improve ourselves or to give some uh, uh, input for others to for improvement. That's it. Yes. Yeah. The people in power have to get together. People who are the keepers of Ayurveda, teachers, by is the greatest that are in the world. It's time for them. That's what Maharishi did. He brought all the Vaidyas together. What did he do? He spent a lot of money and time, but a short period of time. That's what impressed me. I could not believe when I found out. And the world doesn't even know about it. I've done my own research and survey. They don't know his work. Even the TM people don't know. So I had to put my own money to do that chapter in the film. Same thing with P.S. Varian. Nobody knows what this giant did against all odds, two world wars, um, British Raj uh, crushing Ayurveda against all odds and in the shortest period of time. He, was, he died at 59 or something like that. So these are examples right in front of us. I should watch my film and get inspired or go to PM Modi. I would, if they gave me time, I would speak like this. There is no time to lose. Bring all the Vaidyas together and get to work. It can be done. Absolutely. Guru Shishya can come up like that. If Dr. Swoboda says, I need 15 students to come with me, do you think anybody would stop? People would run after it or any of the great uh, doctors, Martina or whoever, and the government pays for a Gurukula uh, setting and you know supports it. I would support it. But it's time for the great minds to come together. They're just in their own worlds. That's the problem. Yes. Books and lectures. And it doesn't work that way when we have a, a pandemic of lack of knowledge and a dying tradition that is so valuable. I mean, I cry, Martina. I cry every day in sweetness. What can I do? I wish God had given me millions of dollars. I don't know why he didn't. But anyway. <laughs> I would do it. I have heard thing. those who have millions of dollars that um, even if they use all of them, it would be still drop in the ocean. Yeah. So, um, you okay. know, uh, I think there is enough knowledge. Um, it's the openness of the mind that... And that, coming together, that we, unity. Because yeah, from yeah. the openness of the mind or true understanding comes the right action. So um, it's, it's the mind, um, the global mind, um, the awareness, uh, consciousness that uh, needs uplifting, actually. I wish I could talk to Kote Jaji or so. I'm nobody, so I won't even get an appointment. But if you can, give me five minutes, get me with them. I'll do my best. This is an idea because Sangeet Research Academy in Calcutta was formed in the 1975 by Pandit Vijay Kichlu to create a gurukula because raga music cannot be advanced with the guru without that system. That's it, period. Master disciple is the only way to get excellence of Tansens or Ravi Shankar. He determined it, he got a corporation to fund it and it has been done in 1975 and they created 25 geniuses in 20 years. Geniuses that you, Zakir Hussain level of geniuses. So we can do that for Ayurveda. I want to talk to them about it. The ITC, the Indian Tobacco Company was the one who funded it. And it was this mastermind that made the greatest vocalists, 
and now the whole institution is down the road once Pandit Kichlu left and retired. But that's, we have to take examples, Maharishi, this, that, and the other, replicate it. It can be done. There are some doctors. Um, did you speak also to Dr. Gangadharan in Bangalore? No, I did not. He is, he is also promoting the, the, the guru uh, education system. No, uh, no, there are, but not enough for this huge pandemic that we have, Iris. That's pandemic of knowledge, uh, lack of knowledge mm -hmm. and uh, transmission. I'm mm -hmm. talking, it's a very major thing when a tradition is wobbly and not going where a high, as high as it should. I think um, Mr. Kotecha is doing a, a very, very good and smart work <laughs> because he knows yeah. what is asking the government. He knows what is asking the, the, the allopathic uh, adopters, what they are asking. And he is, he is moving in between. And um, he's doing a lot of studies. He's, uh, he's giving the supportance to Ayurveda by the studies so that he can show this to the allopathic doctors. And in the same way, he's establishing it, as I told before, that he's going to the rural parts. And this is part of his personal biography because he was as a doctor in a rural part and he didn't have medicines and he had to cure the people. And so he went out uh, looking at the, um, at, the, uh, at the earth, at the surroundings, and he was finding all the plants there. And he was setting up um, a, a pharmacy in this uh, way, that he was involving the people from the, uh, from the uh, villages to bring oh. him all these plants and when he could, uh, could give them to the patients. So he is really, he himself, by his own life and experience, knows what it does mean to stay in a part where there's nothing to, to, to get. And, um, and now with COVID, he is also doing a lot of studies, actually, and showing I, that, uh, for example, my, one study my only point is that I'm Pitta times three, Martina knows. Um, there is no time. I think that one a single people are doing wonderful work, but it's time for the cream of the crop to come together. Exactly what Maharishi did. He brought the greatest together. He raked the landscape of uh, Kerala. He brought the Delhi Padma Shri's, Padma Vibhushans together. He did whatever it took. As an example, I'm saying, it's time for that. It's not time for Dr. Gangadhar to do one, Martina to do. It's good. All those things are good. Time is for the greatest to come together and have a very force, forceful effort in a very traditional way, how it worked, how it worked in a modern context, of course. And rope the corporations, rope the the whatever, the pharma, the whoever, the whoever to bring funding. I mean, it can be done. It can be done. I just feel that that's the way out. But maybe five minutes, uh, if you can arrange an interview, I'd love it. I'd love it. Thank you. Uh, just I would like to add uh, two points here. Uh, sure. The first one is, uh, yes, it is very important uh, to start the education system. The amendment has to come from there because at the moment, uh, yes, I am an Ayurvedic doctor. I studied BAMS from India, from government college in Bangalore. But the thing is, mm -hmm. the education system of Ayurveda, it is almost like in competition with MBBS and it is like they're just trying to equate it instead of giving the authenticity of Ayurveda or explaining vata in terms of vata, they're just trying to compare it with the generalized terms and that is where the quality of education or the quality of what authentic Ayurveda that is to be taught is lacking. So, but that would be with the Gurukula system if the people are going back to the traditional, which uh, Martina did a lot of it in right in Prague with your 15 students, right Martina? Well, we started with 52 and we're left with 50 who survived the rigorous training. I mean, it, it, uh, really? you're talking about authenticity and it, it's authentic uh, teaching, it's authentic science and art and it requires a whole person on both sides. So it requires a total dedication. Um, it has yeah. to become 
you know, every breath, every thought, uh, blood, uh, everything um, of the person. And um, those few who um, went through it, um, I mean, it's, it's, they are like, um, it's a relay. It's, it's, it's uh, you passing on um, the timeless knowledge to the next generation and um, they do the best they can within their own, you know, constraints. And that's, that's how it goes. That I, that's how it always went. And that's how it will continue. That's true. Like uh, any of the, for example, uh, like Man said, if it is a cultural thing like music or dance, we have the Guru Shishya Parampara and it always, the lineage is maintained and the tradition is passed over through generations. So when we nurture art like that, this is the science of life. So Ayurveda definitely... This is an art as well though. This is an art as much as a science. So it, we have to... Take it, like, preserve it how Ayurveda is and then leave it to the next generation. So with this regard, I would also like to bring to your notice that uh, Indian Ayurvedic professionals here in Germany, like uh, uh, Gayatri Ma'am is aware of it because she is the one who took the initiative and brought many of the doctors together under one single platform. Now we are successful in bringing, one, uh, like, 76 Ayurvedic Vaidyas under one platform. And we have formed an association by name in the Chef of Gesellschaft für Ayurveda Deutschland, that is the Society of Indian Ayurvedic Professionals. With this, what we intend to do is not uh, competing or like uh, not trying to equate it with the contemporary sciences, but to spread the awareness and give Ayurveda as it is. Like we would like to yeah. create awareness of what exactly Ayurveda is, and we would like to tell that it's not just wellness. Okay. So. Uh, with, uh, that is our intention and uh, I would like to tell you that uh, day after tomorrow is our inauguration. So on occasion yeah. of Ayurveda Day, uh, we are uh, very happy to announce the official inception of our association on Saturday. Oh. May, may your efforts be blessed. Wonderful. Congratulations. <laughs> I think we will have to conclude. We can go on for hours. Uh, I'm very animated, but maybe on another uh, platform we will reconnect but uh, Gayatri and Martina my sincere thanks uh, for your time I know how busy your lives are but uh, and thank you all thank so, you. and do buy my film please do watch it and uh, Ra Yoga Unveiled and Raga Unveiled the other two are exceptionally um, you know full of knowledge and inspiration as well so thank you yeah. Namaste. Thanks.